Hello, everyone. Welcome. i um, really excited to talk to you all today about two of my favorite things, AI and XR. And um, you've probably seen this slide a lot, but there is a hackathon happening. Um, so definitely make sure you've taken a, a screenshot or a picture or something of this. And this is me actually in my home office presenting at Build a couple years ago. And um, my name is Cassie Brevue, and I'm a senior technical program manager at Microsoft. And I work on a product called Onyx Runtime, which we are going to talk about today, which is actually more about AI than XR. Um, so there's a lot of different types of program managers and titles. Can be a con bit confusing, right? And they always mean different things at different companies as well. Um, and so this is what I do. I do all kinds of things, but um, writing code is my favorite, and then sharing it with the community. Um, so we're going to be talking about an introduction to deep learning in Unreal. And this is our agenda for today. Um, we're not going to hit quite the full, probably like 40, 45 minutes or 50 minutes that we have. Um, but we're going to talk about a lot of really fun things. So we're going to talk about deep learning in video games, which is just, there's a lot of really exciting things happening there. And then we're going to talk about style transfer models. Um, and if you don't know what those are, that's okay, because we'll talk about how those are created. Um, we're going to talk about different model hubs as well. So um, how many people in here have built like an AI model before are familiar with the process a little bit? Okay. Um, so, and are you familiar with different like model hubs where you can go and get like pre-built models? So we're going to talk about some of that, which I think not everybody's aware that a lot of times when you go to start building models, you um, think you have to start from scratch, but there's actually like tons of open source stuff you can just go grab and use, which is what we're actually going to build with today. Um, and so then what we're going to be building is we're going to be using this new um, experimental plugin that was released with Unreal Engine 5 um, called the Neural Network Inference Plugin. So that's what we're actually going to be using. Um, and so this is what we're going to be building. The top picture is like just a standard scene. So if you go into Unreal and you create like a basic project, um, it kind of comes out with this scene. And then I just added materials to it. And so it doesn't look that exciting, I know. <laughs> but it's really not about that part. Um, we are going to be able to use AI to real time change a style to the bottom picture using a style transfer model within the game. So that's the cool part. Um, and so if we were to take a look at what this looks like, this is kind of like a sneak peek of what we're building. Um, we are going to enable our uh, real-time style transfer. And then this is now real-time changing the style of the game um, with a couple different models. So this is one of them. And, and how that works is it's taking an image um, or like a picture, and the model learns that style and then is able to apply it to an existing image. And so basically, from a technical standpoint, what we're doing is we're taking essentially a screenshot of the game um, we are then doing different pre-processing effects on it. We're running it through an AI model, which is creating a new image, stylized, and then we're taking that image, creating it as a texture, and applying it to the scene real time. So that's what's happening technically here, and we'll show the code on how to do that. Um, so I wanted to kind of level set. I think most people, they, like most people raise their hands, so they kind of probably know the difference between these different things. Um, but when talking about deep learning, I was specific about deep learning and not AI, because obviously AI has been used in gaming for a long time in a lot of different ways. Um, and AI at a high level is just trying to mimic human intelligence with a computer. Um, and then within that, there's these subsets of ways of doing that. Machine learning, which is um, like classical machine learning where you're taking tasks or you're automating a task with data. And then we are focusing on deep learning specifically. So this is your neural networks. These are your deep learning neural networks that have multiple layers. Um, you need a GPU, and they're generally pretty expensive to train. So we are focusing specifically on this section for a couple of reasons. Like all the really cool stuff, in my opinion right now, are happening in the deep learning space. And a lot of it is super experimental. So we're going to look at, before we jump into the one that we're going to be looking at today, we're going to look at some of the different experiments and things that other people are doing and how it's happening. So one really cool one is animation. Um, so this is a way of automatically uh, um, animating a character with AI rather than having to do that manually and do different motion capture. So we're going to see an example of that. 
Um, automating game logic, okay, this one is really cool. I mean, they're all really cool, but uh, you probably have seen some examples about like Google, or Google, GitHub <laughs> Copilot. Um, and that's using a model called Codex, which is a large language model that was actually trained to write code. And so automating game logic is like, I can use natural language and it can write the code for me. And we're gonna see a demo of that too. Um, and that's kind of coming along in all spaces, not just gaming, like the idea that AI can be a pair programmer for you and you can write natural language, like write a code comment, and it will automatically write the code based on the comment, which is just, again, really cool. <laughs> Um, story generation is another one. So story generation is happening through uh, large language models like GPT-2 and GPT-3. Um, and if you haven't heard of those, those are really like the state-of-the-art natural language processing models. They're using uh, transformer models. Um, they are very expensive to cre uh, create. Like GPT-3 has billions of parameters, millions of dollars to train. Um, and so there's all these different versions of it. But uh, you're able to use that to dynamically create a text-based game. Uh, Playtesting is another cool one that we'll see. Uh, photorealism, where you're able to take real life images and apply them to your game to make it more realistic. And then speech recognition, which I think most people are pretty familiar with different speech recognition. So the first example we are gonna look at is uh, teaching a character how to move. And so this is a really cool project, obviously not one that I created myself, but it's a neural state machine for character scene interactions. And so generally with uh, motion capture, or with creating the animation, you use motion capture to create the realistic character movements. But if you can see on the left, like you can't capture every type of movement. And um, in order to smooth those out, they were able to build a deep learning model that could um, make those interactions more smooth. So that's a super, like when you think about immersive experiences and how like little things like that can really break the fact that you're in a digital experience versus a reality, like that one I think is a really cool, and that's an experimental one. I don't believe that's actually being used in any sort of um, production game. Um, and so we were talking a little bit about code generation and the codex models. Um, so this is an example from Build. And what this one is doing is um, there was a codex model that was tra trained specifically for Babylon JS. So what it's able to do here is take in the natural language like I was talking about and actually write the code and then display it real time. It's insanely cool. Um, and so then it's gonna say I wanna make the cube spin and it'll add the code to do that. And so this is all like, you didn't have to write any code, it's creating the code for you and can create the scene for you. So if I skip a little ahead, oh, there we go. Um, this one's really cool, this is a chessboard. So that one was pretty simple. You're like, okay, it can create a sphere, big deal. But now it's able to create a chessboard with um, one line of natural language. And when you start thinking about what this could do to development and like the development process, this one it was asked to create the solar system um, and it created even Pluto, it included Pluto and <laughs> was able to even add a ring to Saturn. So this is all natural language coming together to create um, a virtual experience using deep learning. Um, so AI Dungeon's a game actually out there. So this one you can actually go play with. A lot of these other ones are really just experimental. Um, but what this one does is you go in and you pick like your scene, um, your character, and then you give your character a name. And then this is using, I think on the back end it's using GPT-2, uh, but it's using large language models to actually dynamically create the story as you go along. So every time you play it's different. Um, and they also have different types of uh, like experiences within it that you can choose. And it's really neat because every time you use this, it's gonna be a dynamically generated uh, game and unique from AI. Um, one thing that I think is also cool with story generation, um, so you might be thinking, well, a lot of storylines need to follow like a static structure in order to build those things out. And having a dynamic storyline isn't necessarily something that you could use. Like there's ways that it could be, but a lot of ways it's still too hard um, because the, it's not always gonna inference the same thing. But I think it'd be really cool also to think about it as helping you build your story. Like what if you went to a large language model and you like, well, you, you kind of had like an idea of something you wanted to build, but you wanted help building out your story. Like just like we can use these codex models to help our writer code, we could use the large language models to help us write our story. This one's probably my, I think, the most eye-catching one. Um, so this one was by GTA 5. And you, I bet a lot of people have seen this one because it like made the news, it was so cool. Um, so what they were actually able to do is they took a convolutional neural network and they're doing frame-by-frame -frame inference. So like similar to what we were doing, where we're doing frame-by-frame -frame inference. 
um, and they're using the cityscape data set and they were able to take their input and then apply the, the realistic photos to take their game and make it look just insanely real. So when you see a GTA 5, that's what it looks like. And when you see ours, that's their model that's been applied to it. And you can see how realistic it's able to do that. I just, I love that one. This is just so cool. Right? Like that's a game and it just looks <laughs> insanely realistic. And being able to use AI to then bring things to that next level, like I think that's just exciting. Okay, so then here's another, this is another um, example from Build. Um, so this is, uh, they're using Teams Mesh, and again, they're using the Babylon Codex model, and then they're also using cognitive services. So there's two people in Microsoft Mesh here, and they're talking to the computer, asking it uh, for different things. Didn't log out of Teams. <laughs> and um, it's able to uh, bring models into the experience by using cognitive services. So it's using cognitive services to Video stop. There we go. Um, so it's using cognitive services to take in natural language. So it's a speech to text. Then it's taking that text, sending it to the codex model. And then the codex model is actually writing the code and executing it and adding things to the environment. It's just insanely cool. And then they're also able to ask for an astronaut and a command module. And uh, this one, is using an open source uh, model library where they're able to ask for it and then it will import it into their scene. So this was one of those things that they just um, announced at Build again, experimental, but really cool to start thinking about what's possible. Um, so this is one that actually the Xbox team is working on. It's called Automated Reachability Testing. And so this one, if you have ever done any game QA, you need to make sure that everything is reachable and that they can't escape the game, like fall out of the world. Those would be bugs with your game. So they're actually using the, the same plugin that we're going to be looking at today, the Neural Network Inference plugin, with Unreal Engine in order to create this. Um, and here's a quick uh, kind of diagram of how they built it. Uh, so they're using Onyx Runtime and Unreal, and they're using something called reinforcement learning, which if you're not familiar with that, it's a type of unsupervised learning, so you're not actually giving it a bunch of data and having it learn from it. You are giving it positive and negative um, feedback, and it's training itself. So this is real-time training itself as it plays the game through reinforcement learning to test it. Um, so this is all exciting, and it looks like, you, I hope your brain's like thinking about all the different ways where you could start using these really cool ways that they're starting to innovate. But in truth, it's still very experimental, um, and a lot of it isn't really even production ready. In fact, even the thing that we're using today, I'm not really sure you could use it in a production. Like, the graphics just aren't to the level that you'd probably put out. Um, and even the, the plugin itself is still an experimental plugin within Unreal. So getting that production level quality is hard. And the performance considerations, right? That's a huge thing in gaming. You need good performance. And um, both gaming, like graphics and uh, AI, all want the GPU. They all want that resource. And so um, needing to make things super efficient is important, which is why they actually chose um, Onyx Runtime. Um, and then creating quality models can be super time consuming. So we have these pre-built models that we can go grab, but if you need something custom that you're gonna create, it's gonna be expensive to create it, it's gonna be expensive to train it. Um, and so these are all still some of like the difficulties of, of where we're at and the experimental nature of it. So now let's talk a little bit about style transfer models. So uh, we talked a little bit about that. So what are they exactly? So if you take a look at this, um, this is actually one of the models we're gonna be looking at too. It's called Rain Princess. So that uh, photo in the middle is a called Rain Princess and it's a painting. And what the model's actually doing is it's uh, learning from that. So it's using a VGG16 model that's been pre-trained on the ImageNet data set. And it takes that and then it uses um, a small encoder and decoder to take this image and then train it so the, the model learns that style. And then it outputs a model that can recreate that style on any image you give it. So that's how the uh, style transfer models are actually working. So it takes the image on the far, your left here, um, applies the AI model and gets that output. There's other ways to do style transfer, but this is the type that we are doing. 
So in order to get this to work, like if you've if you've ever used Unreal or built plugins, you know, like you can take open source libraries and build your own plugins, but it's time consuming and there's lots of different um, difficulties with it. So it's really awesome that um, Unreal or Epic Games reached out and wanted to partner with us to create this um, neural network inference plugin. And if you don't know what Onyx runtime is and Onyx is, let's talk a little bit about that. So I'm sure the people in here that have created AI models um, are familiar with this, but Onyx is basically an open format. So when you train a model, you basically get a file out. It's the simplest way to put it. And there's different types of files that you can use. Um, Onyx is one where you, it's called Open Neural Network Exchange. That's what Onyx stands for. And then once you export it to that format, you can then take it and use it multiple places. Um, so it's important because you might be training in Python, but you might be inferencing in C Sharp. And in our example, we're going to be inferencing in C++. Um, so it allows you to actually port and, and operationalize your models in the ways that you need. And then it also is extremely performant. So these are kind of like the main uh, key factors that of why Onyx Runtime was the right choice to go with here. And um, the deploying many platforms is important as well. So if you want to deploy to mobile, like in Unreal, you can deploy to multiple platforms and Onyx Runtime supports that out of the box. So you can deploy to web, mobile, or desktop, or Xbox. And so this is just a nice graph where you can see like the different training frameworks. Like if you were going to train your own model, they're generally trained in like PyTorch, TensorFlow, um, Keras, um, and Scikit-Learn for uh, classical machine learning. You convert it to Onyx. Then once you have Onyx runtime, now you can deploy wherever and inference with whatever supported language. And then this is just an overview of the neural network inference plugin, um, how it's used, and some of the different things that it's able to do. And now, we'll get to the good stuff, the demo. Over, there we go. Okay, so this is, um, once you have um, Epic, or Epic Unreal running locally, um, in this content browser is where I've actually got my models, and let me show you where I've got those from. So I've got these models from the Onyx Model Hub. So there's different model hubs where I was saying that you can go and just grab pre-built models rather than building your own. Um, this one is the Onyx Model Hub, and there's a lot of different models within here that are already in the Onyx format that you could literally just go grab and use with this um, plugin if uh, you didn't want to have to like go build it yourself. And there's a lot of the basic things have been solved. So um, image classification, um, we are looking at an image manipulation model. Um, so super resolution is a really cool one too, where if you have, if you're not familiar with what super resolution is, if you have a blurry picture, you're able to apply a neural network that'll actually enhance it and make it more clear. Um, so that's what that one does. But we did this uh, fast neural style transfer. And if you take a look, so here's the different models that it just has out of the box. These are models that have already been trained for you. Um, we're going to look at a few of them. You can just literally download them and use them. But if you want to actually build a new one, like maybe there's a particular style that you want to have, it has the source code in here as well, which is open source from PyTorch. So you could come in here um, and run this on new images uh, to create new models with new styles. So you could take this entire project that you see, you could take the source code, and you could train any, any style that you could think of. And then the other really neat hub um, is Hugging Face. So Hugging Face is doing a lot of really cool things in the machine learning world, in my opinion. And in many's, I think they're, they're really changing the open machine learning landscape. There are tons of different models available in here. And it's kind of, you can think of it kind of like the, the GitHub for uh, machine learning, um, because there are a lot of community members that join here and will do different uh, optimizations or they'll do different transfer learning techniques and then create a cool model and post it out there for you to just go grab it. So this probably is the, like has the most um, models uh, and different types of models. And if you build something cool, definitely upload it so the community can use it. It also has data sets and things like that as well. So a really good place to kind of start. 
And then I'll provide this link at the end, but this is the source code, so you can actually um, grab the source code and everything that we're going to go through today and uh, run it yourself as well. So now let's go back here. So in the uh, Explorer here, I just drag and dropped my models in and imported it into my um, Unreal. And then if I open up this, this is the blueprint that is kicking it off. So for when I hit play, it's just um, enabling this uh, view, the real-time style transfer. And then it's setting the network and then um, setting the style. And then this is just stopping it. So that's the only thing that's happening in the blueprint. Everything else is in C++. And if we take a look at this, we can see the different models here. So in order to like choose a different model, we can literally just grab it here and then hit play and see it working. So this is all happening real time. If I wanted to see a different model, I can just go back to my details, take a look at Rain Princess. This is my favorite one. I just think this one is so cool. And I'm able to even interact with the scene, right? Um, and like, if you look at the sky, like that looks just like the painting, like it's just so cool. Okay, so let's take a look at how we actually did this. So I'm gonna go back to enable my breakpoints. Play, and we'll step through what's happening. Uh, so here, the first thing we're doing, well, and let me just tell you quick, the, um, this is the main two classes that we're going to be using, the My Neural Network class, which is where we have our um, neural network logic, and then the view extension. So the first thing I'm doing is initializing my network, setting the device to GPU. Like There might be situations where you don't want to use the GPU, so you can decide which one. And then this is actually grabbing that model that we just selected. bit easier to see. Okay. So if we go down here to the next, so we're grabbing the input texture and then we're also grabbing the height and width of the current scene. Um, we're going to need this because we're going to have to resize it for our model, which I'll talk about why. If we step into our um, copy texture, What's happening here is we are actually taking a read surface, so we're actually reading the surface data, getting the texture of the current scene. So we need to actually read in the data of the current scene and um, process that into the input image CPU. And so we're grabbing the, the raw image and then we're grabbing out the RGB values into our um, object. So with machine learning, there's a lot of different types of uh, pre-processing that you have to do in order to get a model ready to um, process your data. Like you can't just send it, you need to do different things. So like models are expecting a uh, tensor shape. And so in order to do that, get the right tensor shape, we have to do some different things to our image in order to get it in the right shape. And we're actually using another uh, plugin here called uh, for OpenCV. Um, so we're using the Unreal I'm sorry, the neural network inference, but there's another experimental one that was just um, released as well, which is the OpenCV helper. And if you're not familiar what OpenCV is, it's a common library used for computer vision in C++. I think there's a JavaScript one too, um, Python. It, it's like one of the go-to open source libraries for doing computer vision. Um, and so we're able to actually just use that in here since the plugin was also released with UE5. And so what we're doing here is we're creating um, a CV image we are grabbing that height and width. Um, it's an int 8 with a three channels, so RGB, and then we're reading the data in from our object. And then we're creating an output image, which is in the 224 by 224 size, which is what our model is expecting. Now, because we're using a pre-built model, we have to use the size that the model was trained in. Um, you could do different sizes, but the, the bigger the image, the less performant. So you want to kind of do like the smallest work, you can get good results. And then we're going to resize that. So we're taking our input image and we're resizing it to um, the shape that our model is expecting. 
and then we're doing something else here. And if you've done computer vision, this should all look really familiar, because <laughs> any computer vision problem you do, you're gonna have to do these same types of transforms on your data in order to run inference. Uh, so then we are um, creating our vector, and then we're normalizing it. And basically that just means we're normaling, normalizing our values from between zero to 225, right? Because pixels are between zero and 225, or I'm sorry, 255. And then um, we're dividing by 255, which gives us values between zero and one, and that just makes our model more performant. So it's called something called normalizing your data. And then from there, this is expecting um, channel height width instead of height width channel. So we're gonna leap, loop through and do that processing. Then in apply style, now we're actually ready. Do I have that? Oh, I went a little too far. Um, I'm gonna hit that again. See if it'll let me do this. Sometimes Visual Studio gets like really upset when you do this and sometimes it lets you. We're gonna see. Don't let me down, Visual Studio. Nope, it's not gonna let me. Okay, well. It's all right, I think our, our properties should still be there. So basically what happens, I just actually stepped over the run model, uh, but what's happening here is we're making sure our network is loaded. Uh, we're passing in that image that we just pre-processed, and then we're running inference. And this is the part I wanted you to see because this happens so fast. It's like, like that. Um, the fact that we're able to get good results that quickly is pretty amazing. And then from there, we're getting our output tensor. Oh, you can't see that, which is just a bunch of float numbers. So when you get your inference result back, um, there's a bunch of float numbers here. We're grabbing that array. And then from there, we actually have to change that array back to colors. So we do that by um, this float uh, to color. So we're going from all these decimal float values back to um, a uint 8 between 0 and 225, and that's giving us our result. Um, so then, yeah, we're just getting back that result. And then... This breakpoint was set right. I just didn't hit that one. Yeah, okay, good. Um, now we're gonna resize it back. So if you remember, we took our output and we resized it to 224, but our, our screen is much bigger than that. So we need to actually resize our image back to the size of the screen. And so we're gonna use OpenCV again. And we are going to uh, get our results image. We're gonna get the data from the output. So this output image is actually our stylized image now. Um, and then we're resizing to that height and width value using, again, OpenCV. We're gonna create our image, uh, stylized image CPU. And so this one right here, you know how you like have one of those problems that takes you weeks to solve and then ends up being like 10 lines of code? That was one of these problems that you're looking at because the, the style was not applying right. Um, so everything looked right, I was getting my image out right, but when I was applying it, the colors were wrong and it was like, too blurry, ended up being because it needed to be a uint32 instead of a uint8, and then cast to a uint8. So um, this right here was a lot of labor. <laughs> and I got help from the Xbox team too. That was, that was nice of them. <laughs> okay, so now that we have uh, got our result back, um, we need to actually apply it to the scene, and we're gonna do that by creating a texture and then um, we are going to apply that texture by updating it with our stylized image. And that's it, that's like the whole process. So that is happening every single time. So now when I go back to debug, and I will disable my breakpoints, unless you want me to go again so you can see how fast it inference is. I don't know how exciting that is. Um, but if I hit play again, we can see this is what's happening as I walk around. And it's happening that fast, where like there's no lag, which is super cool. And the, the blurriness is the one thing I would like to improve still, but. I thought so, but I was actually thinking it might be something about the style of the image itself. Because if you look at the style of the image itself, it's not a super detailed image. So I thought it was that. Um, but I played around with that, and I also played around with like super resolution, and I, there, I think it might be a couple different things, um, but it's still something I don't know for sure, um, is that it could be the, I don't think it's the size of the image, I think it's the image itself, so I was thinking if I had a really detailed photograph and then I applied it, would I still have that blurriness? Um, but yeah, it, it's a good question that I like haven't solved yet, and I've 
played around with a little bit. But I think it'd be really neat. The other thing that I think might be cool is like applying it to a particular item in a scene versus the whole scene, which I haven't played with at all. Which right now, you couldn't do it with the way I'm doing it here because we're grabbing a screenshot. We're applying the whole thing. Um, but one thing I hope people grab this and like do something cooler than I did. Like this is just like, what can I do? That, that's kind of what this project was, an, an idea of, of what can I create and um, like what kind of cool things are out there and, and that kind of things and how do I use this new plugin. Oh, which I forgot to show you to add the plugins if you haven't used Unreal. You just go to edit, add plugins. Um, and you can see there's the neural network inference one. And they are continuing to work on it too. So this is the experimental one. Um, we're continuing to work with Epic to improve it. So also if you run into like issues and things that you're, you're wishing it would do, for one thing right now, um, the input as a texture would save us some time and some processing. So that was one thing that would be helpful with this one. Um, sure, yeah. Exactly. Is there Mm-hmm. Yeah, it'll throw errors for you. It'll throw exceptions and it'll say this is the wrong shape because it has to be this the tensor has to be the same shape. Yep. Right, and so like when you're new to machine learning, it's gonna be really confusing right away because you're like, I don't know what this means, right? But, but that's usually what it means if it's saying I'm like getting the wrong size tensor, it's because you're sending in the wrong shape. They are working on cool ways, um, I've seen like some model report cards and metadata in order to um, actually embed that type of information into your model itself. Because um, another thing that can happen um, with Onyx models um, is you need to know, or with any model is the there's sometimes a string label for your input and output, and you need to know what that is. So like in Onyx Runtime, we have an API so you can get the input and output um, while you're running versus having to know. So that's another thing where if you're grabbing models that somebody else built and you don't necessarily know that particular information about the model. Yeah, Netron's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yep, and it's a, it, yeah, that's a really good tool and a good point because it also shows you the weights and how it's making decisions and stuff like that within the model. So it's a great way to get kind of that information about models that you don't know about. Yes. Um, okay. So that's how we did that. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. Unless there, is there any other like questions on that part? I guess we, we'll still have time too. The only thing that's left here is, um, some resources here. So yeah, let's jump into questions. Mm -hmm. So I haven't run like any analytics, but like I, it's talking to me. So like, but Unreal in general, when I'm running on my machine, it still is. And I think I have a, I have a 3070 maybe? I forgot. Uh, but I have a good GPU on this laptop and it still is. Yeah, so that's the other thing is, is that's why I say a lot of it's really experimental because I don't know that you would want to take on that, that, that inference load on your game. And so it would depend on what you're doing. And this is a pretty small model. Um, too. That's another thing to think about is this is a smaller model that we're actually using. Um, so the other thing, like what if you created, I don't know, there's just so many ways you could start using it, but that's why the space is still um, really evolving. And I also just think the hardware is trying to catch up. You know, like there's NPUs, there's GPUs, and there's there's different ways people are looking at us. Like, how do we maximize? Because like right now, our, that's where our we're being held back. Like, it's not like the software side or the math side. Like, we can create these things, but we're limited by the hardware that it's running on. Um, which is that the Azure Remote Rendering. I actually haven't played with it much, but I'm curious on how how like that could help play with the the like difficulty and the the resources that you need.
Yeah, so what he's asking is if you could add another model that would improve the quality of the result. And I was playing around with that a little bit with super resolution. Um, the difference was, so the problem with super resolution is it's not RGB. And so I have to do yet another transform on um, my data to get it into the right format. And then from there, I have to go back to RGB and then back. So there was like so many steps to doing that that I was thinking that it might not be the best route. But you totally, like multi-model inference um, pipelines are definitely something that are used and could be looked at. And I, I did think about that. Um, if you can get it working, cool, likes, <laughs> do a PR. Uh, but, but yeah. Um, I was thinking about that as well. And, and I think that there's, there's definitely situations where multi-model makes sense. Um, with this one, I think it really is um, looking at the image itself and just playing with different styles and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Every frame, it's reapplying that. As, it's updating the texture. So it's doing something called it's a post-processing material is what um, Unreal does. And so it's creating that texture and then applying it post-processing. So it, there's a lot of different types of post-processing materials and that is used today. The difference is that we're getting the material with um, an AI model that is dynamically creating it. So like being able to post-process and add effects after is something that happens today in games that you use and is part of Unreal. Yeah. Stay entirely on the GPU. You right. You need the entire image. So we have to copy back and forth, yeah. and that's part of the thing that we want to work on, um, because it's experimental. And and but yeah, because of, that's also something that could help with the performance as well. And then um, yeah, trying different model uh, sizes as well, like maybe. Like, I don't think the model size in this is an issue. I think the model is the right size because you don't need to make it bigger just to make, like, I don't think that would actually help the resolution that much. Uh, but I think there's a lot of things that you could try. And I'll say, I mean, building this out and like experimenting, it probably took me like three months to build all this out. And so there's a lot of things like I want to still do, but I haven't had like time to really experiment with. <laughs> I mean, it only took, what, 10 minutes to walk through the code? <laughs> yes. This is GPU, yeah. Yeah, so we're inferencing on GPU. Um, and then, I mean, the Unreal is utilizing the GPU to run the game as well. But yeah, we're inferencing on GPU, if, if that's what, you, is that kind of what you mean? Yeah. Exactly. So when you saw in the code, if you want me to go back, where I was setting the, um, the device up here, um, I can set, multiple different devices. Um, so I could change this to CPU and I could be running it on CPU. But because I set my device to GPU and GPU is available, I'm able to leverage that. But it maybe you're um, deploying to a target that doesn't have uh, GPU, um, you could set it to CPU. Any, any other questions? No, yeah, yes? Yeah. I'm curious if this Okay. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Yeah, no, it's a good question. So she's asking if you could use Barracuda um, with Onyx Runtime um, in Unity. So uh, Barracuda is actually Unity's specific um, plugin that they've created to do inferencing in their engine. So Barracuda is specific to um, Unity, and they had built their own inferencing engine. Um, if you wanted to use Onyx Runtime in Unity, you could, but you would have to build your own plugin to do that at this point. Um, but yeah, so they do have it. Um, but yeah, it, it does actually support Onyx Format, though. That's the other thing, is Barracuda supports Onyx Format. So you don't have to use Onyx Runtime to use an Onyx model. So you could definitely use Barracuda and Onyx. Um, their support is different though, for, and like for um, different platforms, like we, we support more platforms. Um, in general, I think our performance is higher, but I'd have to double check that one. But yeah, so, so they are similar, um, and it just kind of depends on what you're using. And if you want to build it out yourself, which takes time. <laughs>
So that's a good question. Is that, is that everything? Cool. Uh, let me get these. Did everybody get the resource slide um, up here? Why does it keep doing that? I got to change my main mod monitor. There we go. Everybody got the resources? Um, so Onyx Runtime YouTube, I guess I'll just run through these quick. Um, I create a lot of videos for Onyx Runtime on the YouTube channel. And I actually have a video on this one as well. So if you want to go take a look at this demo again, it's actually on the Onyx Runtime YouTube channel. Um, the Onyx Runtime docs, if you're interested in just more about learning more about Onyx Runtime and our Twitter. And then the last one here uh, is the uh, source code for the demo that you can go download and run. Cool. So thank you. And then also, uh, Johan Verwey, I had to call him out because he was the dude on the Icebox team that really helped me here on that problem, that 10 lines of code that were, was, yeah, that was his awesomeness. So, <laughs> so thank you so much. And also, if you want um, any stickers, I have some stickers up here. This one's super cool. I think it looks like a throwing star. Anyways, <laughs> thank you.